Okay, so I'm going to talk today about student algorithms and how we can use student algorithms to move towards efficient standard algorithms. So the idea is we have student algorithms which the kids invent, and I'll show you some examples of that in a second, and we move the kids towards efficient versions of those algorithms, right? So we're trying to get them to be efficient, but really understand what they're using. So not moving them towards an efficient algorithm that they don't understand, but move towards an algorithm that they have some understanding. And then move them towards our standard algorithms and show them how the algorithms they use are related to the standard algorithms. And this is a long process and, and children sort of move from here all the way down with the key being that they always should be understanding what they're doing. So we want them to be able to get the standard algorithms because they're efficient, they're fast, they're useful, and there's some thought that's necessary to be able to use those algorithms. There's some thinking involved if you use if they understand what's going on. But starting with things they understand and moving towards uh, along efficiency towards the standard algorithms. And there's a couple reasons to do that. So for example, let's suppose a kid, you know, you ask them to add together uh, 15 plus 17. And what lots of kids will do initially, uh, most of them and probably in fact, is they will draw out 15 things. And they may uh, group them like this, and then they'll draw out 17 things. And you shouldn't be surprised to see them grouping by fives or grouping by tens even, or even not using groups at all. In fact, it might have been very common for kids to use something more like this, where they make a line of 17, 15 things. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then make another line of 17. You can see this is a really painfully slow way of doing this addition. 5, 10, I think that's 17, 15, say 5, 10, see it's, it's, I mean it's, it takes a long time. And then what they'll do is they'll count, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, blah, 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 until they get to 32. Although they probably won't get to 32, they'll get to something else. So you see this, this is a bit of a problem. We don't want them to be doing this. So the question is, how do we sort of move them towards a better algorithm? And I think, you know, kids don't want to do a huge amount of extra work. And so you might say, why don't we take this and this and this and group it by fives? And then you can go that you have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And, you know, and then your answer is more likely to be 32 a bit faster. And then you might say, why don't we try grouping this one uh, by tens? Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then they group again and they get another 10. Hopefully that counted 10 correctly because that would be pretty embarrassing if not. And then here's another 10 right here, right? So then we got 1, 2, 3, 10, so just 30, and 2 is 32 again. So you're getting them to do some grouping. Even better is if they see that other students have used these techniques naturally. So if you've got a kid who's using counting, Counting is not an efficient strategy for adding 15 and 17, but it is one they understand. So then you can move them to a different kind of counting, counting by fives maybe, counting by tens if that's convenient. Even counting by twos will be more convenient than counting by individual numbers. But the, the idea is that you're trying to move them into a more efficient strategy and to be thinking about strategies. Thinking about strategies is an abstraction, it's doing mathematics. Using someone's strategy that you don't understand is not really doing mathematics, in my opinion, maybe doing arithmetic. But so we want them to be thinking. So now another example would be, let's suppose you ask them to add together 234 plus, let's say, uh, 167. Okay, so here's a typical problem. Um, I might sort of say, well, let's add the fours together, the ones together first. Four and seven is 11. Let's add the tens together now. 30 and 60 is 90. Let's add the hundreds together. Uh, 200 and 100 is 300. And now we can do our addition. We've got one one. So we, wait a minute, we've got 10 tens. That's another hundred. So we're going to have to add 1 to the hundreds. So there's no tens left, and we've got an extra 10, so we've got 4 into 1. That's borrowing, by the way, right? That's, that's the thing, where, sorry, that's carrying, where you carry over. So the same sort of concept comes into place. So this is a reasonably efficient, understandable algorithm that students can, can use, 
And what's nice about this algorithm is it preserves place value, right? So whereas with the standard algorithm, students initially may not see that it's preserving place value. So you might want to transfer them into the standard algorithm once they understand this by, you know, making some observations. So I had a 4 and a 7. That became a 10 and a 1. Why don't I record the 1 here and record the 10 here? And then when I do the next addition, I'm going to see that I have 1 and 3 and 6, which is 10 tens. So that means there's going to be uh, no tens left over and an extra 100, right? Because 10 tens is 100. And then 1 and 2 and 1 is 4. So they're just recording what they've done here on the left differently. And so it's a little less time consuming in the long run. But then they're not, they're not thinking of these ones as being a 1. They're thinking of them as being a 1, 10, and and 10 tens or 1 100. But I would start with the algorithm they understand and move them into this more efficient algorithm through understanding. So the goal is this algorithm, the standard algorithm, because it's nice and fast. But part of the reason why that's the goal is because you get them thinking about what these operations mean, get them abstracting. If you're getting children abstracting, they're doing mathematics.